at this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Delaware Update, and this does start our webinar. Our webinar is taking place on September 13, 2016. Thank you, and welcome, Dan. Uh, thank you, Amanda, and thank you all for attending this truly very interesting uh, hour that we're going to be uh, showing to you guys here regarding the updates to Delaware due diligence uh, pertaining to corporations. Uh, for those out there, my name is Dan Lias. I am the transactional business consultant for CT in the Midwest region. Nice way of saying I'm a, a lawyer and also a nerd. So I appreciate you guys for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to listen to this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, the presenter is sitting to my left, and he will be spending the next uh, hour or so. His name is Alan Shakura. I butchered his name already. But I've known Alan for a long time here at CT. He's been with us for over 16 years in our government relations. Most of you probably have dealt with him in one capacity or another. Uh, when, you, when you've when you had some uh, sticky issues here and there at Delaware, it's Alan that we reach out to. And he's been kind enough to give us uh, an hour of his time today to go through the Delaware updates. So without any further ado, I'm turning this over to Alan. And uh, Alan, again, thank you for, for doing this for us. Great. Thanks so much for joining, everyone. As Dan mentioned, my name is Alan Stachura. I'm based in CT's Wilmington, Delaware office. And my goal over the next hour is to deliver a Delaware Update seminar for you. Our official agenda today is that we're going to talk about some of the trends and some of the things that we've seen over the last year, 2015 specifically. We'll then dive into the Delaware Updates. And we've made sure that there are lots of uh, different pieces of information for you and a lot of different takeaways so that you won't have to remember all of the specifics that we discuss. We'll touch base on some pending legislation items, talk about annual reports and franchise taxes, and then if we have time at the end, we'll answer questions, although I do encourage you to type your questions throughout so that we can make sure that we get them answered either at the end of the webinar or uh, afterwards and, and send those out uh, via email to you. So with that, let's talk a little bit about what we've seen in the state of Delaware. Okay, we're on to our first polling question for those of you who would like CLE. Um, polling question number one, and please answer in the, the poll that I'll be sending you. And the question is, what percent of the Fortune 500 are incorporated in Delaware? A95, B43, C66, or D83? Please enter. Again, this is polling question number three for CLE. What percent of the Fortune 500 are incorporated in Delaware? And the choices, of course, are A, 95, B, 43, C, 66, or D, 83. Just a couple more seconds here for you to fill in your answer for your CLE. And we've come to a conclusion. We finished here. And poll details. We'll push the results. And we have, most of you have a the f number 1A, 95%. Alan, what do you have to say about that? Great. And actually, that's the answer that I get around the country most often. Most people believe that uh, the correct answer is somewhere between 90 and 100%. They're often very, very surprised to find out that Delaware currently has 66% of the Fortune 500 companies. So about 25% of you were dead on, so congratulations for you on that. If you're really thinking that that's pretty low, keep in mind that the number two jurisdiction is actually New York State, and New York State has 4% of the Fortune 500 companies, so a really dramatic drop off. We oftentimes get the question about Nevada, really being the next Delaware, and currently in terms of Fortune 500, Nevada is in 11th place. They have 0.8% of the Fortune 500 companies. So it's a really a sizable, sizable difference in the mentality between Delaware and the other jurisdictions. In terms of Delaware specifically, they currently have just under 1.2 million active entities. About 300,000 of those are corporations. And the balance are what we consider the alternative entities, which include our LLCs, LPs, GPs, statutory trusts, double LPs, triple LPs, and really any other new, 
letter combination that you could possibly come up with. Delaware last year formed just shy of 180,000 new business entities uh, over the course of 2015. And that was really pretty significant because it broke all records uh, in their history. Should you ever wonder about just how important Delaware is to our overall U.S. economy or to the U.S. stock markets, keep in mind that over the last 10 years, 85% of all the new initial public offerings that have been done in the U.S. have been for entities that are either formed or incorporated in the state of Delaware. In fact, last year, if we look at the year on its own, it was a full 89% of all the IPOs that were for entities that were based in the state of Delaware. If you look at stock uh, that's traded in America, a full 65% of the stock uh, items that are, are traded in the U.S. are incorporated or formed in the state. And a few years ago, Delaware wanted to be able to say that they had one business entity per human residing in the state. And Delaware really had a full court press to make sure that they were able to advertise that. They currently can advertise that they have 1.1 active business entities per human residing in Delaware. So it really shows you that everyone wants to incorporate in the state of Delaware. This chart here shows us the new entity formations over the last 10 years. And in case you can't make out the coloration from the legend, the bottom, the light blue, represents new corporations. Above that, the light green represents LLCs. The yellow above that represents the LPs. And then at the very top, that reddish represents the statutory trusts. And what we can see is very much the overall uh, new formation trend very much follows the U.S. economy, the stock market, and every other economic indicator that we've seen. If we look back, 2007 was an amazing year. Delaware formed about 14,000 new business entities per month. We obviously know that that boom was uh, quite related to the real estate market and was very short-lived, or certainly more short-lived than we would have hoped. In 2009, we sank significantly. It was the worst year in recent history, some months being as bad as only 6,500 new business entities per month. Over the last few years, we've been growing pretty steadily and pretty consistently. 2015, we exceeded 15,000 new business entities each and every month. And we were able to say that we had broken all of the records that Delaware had ever seen. The even better news is that we're currently 1.8% ahead of last year. So we are certainly uh, poised, as long as we keep this up, to have an even better, again, record-breaking year for 2016. If we look at this next slide, colors are going to be the same, but the information we're reflecting is very different. This slide shows us the total entities on file in the state of Delaware. What it really highlights is the explosive growth in that light green or that LLC market over the last 10 years. We know that corporations have been around since the early 1900s, and uh, LLCs have been around since the early 1990s in Delaware. And certainly where we spend the vast majority of our time and where we see the vast uh, majority, the quantity of entities is really in that LLC market. For a few years, we had talked about the light blue or the corporations dwindling just a little bit each and every year. But what's interesting is for the last four or five years, we've seen a slight growth and increase in the corporations that have been on file. And when we've talked to our customers who are forming more and more corporations about it, what they've told us that is that in the largest financing deals or in the international transactions, in many cases, the corporations are actually the favored entity type. So not to say that they're going to take over the world by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly they're not going away. It's also interesting to note that we can track this trend back as far as 1929. And we can see that regardless of economic uh, conditions for that time period, Delaware has never lost total entities on file from one year to the next. You'll notice that during some of the rougher years, we didn't see very much of a growth, but it really highlights the stability of this industry within the state of Delaware and just the fact that uh, it really is going to stay pretty consistent 
regardless of, of what the economy is going through at that moment. So with that, let's take a look at some of the updates that have taken place in the state of Delaware. One of the great things about Delaware is that they're very quick to amend their laws and they try and keep everything as up to date and uh, real time as humanly possible. So we've seen a lot of different changes take place over the last few years. And my goal is to run you through some of the most important as well as some of the most recent changes. Now after the seminar, you'll have some takeaway materials and it'll include most of the details that we're going to discuss. So don't feel as though you need to uh, take too copious of notes during this. Okay, we're on to polling question number two then. For those of you who like CLE, please uh, enter your choice in the polling box, not in the Q&A box. That would be extremely helpful. And here we are. Here comes the polling question, and it is, are you familiar with House Bill 267? And your choices are A, yes, or B, no. And again, this is for CLA. Please enter in the polling box and not in the Q&A box. And the question is, are you familiar with House Bill 267? And the choices are A, yes, and B, no. Just a few more seconds we have for you to answer your question here so we can get CLE for you. And... We are going to send you the results, and Alan, we, oh, I think the wrong results actually came up there. <laughs> there we are, here they come, and it didn't, it actually didn't calculate correctly here on the thing. Alan, I think you're going to just have to gonna go, go ahead um, yourself then, uh, mo moving on to the next question, I mean next section, okay? And we'll straighten that out with the technical part. Thank you. Absolutely. Great. So House Bill 267 is a bill that's been around for a little while. It was first introduced in 2009, and it had four different parts to it. It more or less was a bill that increased revenue uh, across the state. And what they did was put it into four different effective dates. So the first went about increasing taxes. The second increased the business entity fees. Third increased the UCC fees. And the fourth increased uh, fees uh, related to penalties and interest and calculations, et cetera. I won't bore you with all of the details because it's been a little while. But the reason we're talking about it is that House Bill 52, or I'm sorry, House Bill 267 was passed with a sunset provision saying that we uh, were able to have all of the fees revert back to their original price as of a specific date. And the reality is that Delaware realized again they would have another budgetary issue, so they introduced what we're calling House Bill 52 that more or less said that the existing prices that were currently available would continue to be the price for the rest of time, therefore making the sunset no longer an actual sunset. So keep in mind, House Bill 267 more or less changed all of the fees, except for the corporate one-hour and two-hour expedite fees, the annual taxes for the alternative entities, and the fees to form a new entity or qualify a new entity as Delaware didn't want to discourage new business from coming into the state. Outside of that, anytime anyone tells you that something's more expensive than they remember, the answer can always be blamed upon House Bill 267. In your packet, we have made sure that we've included the House Bill 267 packet uh, that will tell you all of the old fees and the new fees, and I also included a price list for you just so that you had an at a glance what everything would cost, uh, regardless of what type of service you're using. The logic behind it is that it includes all of the state fees with one certified copy of evidence, but what it does not include is the expedited service that you may opt to do. Exempt entities. Delaware has worked very hard to clean up some of their non-tax entity statutes, and they did so by introducing House Bill 341. It created a new entity type called exempt corporations. Internally, we refer to them as type R. 
and they include all entities that are exempt from taxes, such as the federally exempt entities, those 501c entities, the civic organizations, the charitable and fraternal organizations, religious groups, and nonprofits. The real advantage here is that they have a reduced annual report fee. They pay exactly half. So the for-profit companies are paying $50 per year, and the nonprofit companies are paying $25 per year. These entities pay absolutely no franchise tax whatsoever. The renewal fee, should they ever lose their good standing status and go void, is probably the cheapest filing fee that we'll find in Delaware. It's a flat $5. But what's really key here is that in order to be an exempt entity, we must state an exempt purpose at somewhere in either the formation or the amendment document that makes us see that it is an exempt entity. Without this information, Delaware may convert this entity into a minimum tax corporation if it doesn't meet all of the requirements, specifically having that exempt purpose included in the document. Some expedited options. Most of us are probably familiar with the basic expedites. But just to review all of the expedites, as well as some of the specialized expedites, we want to make you familiar with the fact that Delaware does offer a 30-minute $1,500 expedite. That expedite is available for all filing types except UCCs, preclearances, validations, and any filing that includes the word bank in its entity name. Outside of that, $1,500 means that your filing will be reviewed and approved within 30 minutes. Delaware then offers the one-hour $1,000 expedite service, which is available for everything except for validations, a two-hour $500 expedite, which is available, again, for everything except validations, and then we have our same-day and 24-hour expedites that can range between $50 and $200 depending on what it is we're filing and what time of day we're filing that document. There is one specialized expedite, though, that many people aren't aware of that's actually quite interesting and often can be quite helpful. In fact, I ran into a situation this morning where it was kind of the save the day uh, way to get a deal accomplished. Delaware calls it their global filing service. And the logic behind it was that the state of Delaware is the international powerhouse for all of these deals across the world. But there are times when Delaware is closed and other jurisdictions are still working on conducting business. So in theory, if there was a deal that was closing in China on July the 4th, obviously in the U.S., we're very much all celebrating July the 4th and not worrying about filing documents. But Delaware's theory was, why shouldn't another group be able to utilize that as their file date. Now this is truly talking about a file date, not an effective date, so very, very different. And what Delaware said is, we could roll out this global filing service, we could secure that file date for you, regardless of whether the state is opened or closed. The reality is that we've seen about 98% of the global filing service transactions completed by U.S. law firms, more so than global. Uh, entities. But the reality is well, what it's become is more of a secured future file date. It's an insurance policy. It allows us to purchase a file date in the future and be guaranteed that we would be able to utilize that file date whenever we need it. So what it means is that we have to send the document into the state of Delaware in advance of the file date and time that we're selecting. We can choose any future date and or time, whether the state's opened or closed. So we could choose Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock. We could choose Sunday morning at noon. Or we could choose a random holiday when we know that the state would be closed. We pay the state a $1,000 expedite fee. The state then holds on to that document for us. They process it. And they return evidence at the next time that they're readily open for business. So in the instance where we use Thursday at 2 o'clock, they'd be open, and they would send us back our evidence that day. But in the case of a Sunday at noon, we wouldn't see that evidence back until Monday morning, although it would have Sunday's file date on it. 
What's really nice about it is that it's very flexible. Should we need to change the document after it's been submitted, we can change that document as many times as we need prior to the document being filed for no additional fee. And if we need to have the document pulled, we can actually pull and have nothing recorded prior to it actually being approved. And we can not only receive our document back, but all of the money back that we would have paid. Okay, we're on to question number three for CLE. Um, there was a technical glitch for question number two. Um, we're just going to omit that question for CLE. So even though um, you were not able to answer it because the polling question number one came up twice, unfortunately, um, we're just going to admit that, so don't worry. And with this move, polling question number three will be like our second polling question. And again, please, when you answer, enter into the polling box. And the question is, benefit corporations are for-profit corporations. Is this a true statement or is this a false statement, A or B? And again, the question is, benefit corporations are for-profit corporations, true or false? And again, do not worry about the earlier question number two. We're just going to admit that, omit that question, and uh, that will be not part of the CLE requirements for this webinar. Just a couple seconds here for polling three. Benefit corporations are for-profit corporations. And we're going to push the results to you, Alan. And it looks like we got a 50-50 split here. Here you are. Back to you. Great. Very interesting. So in the state of Delaware, benefit corporations are actually for-profit entities. So 49.8% of you got that. Benefit corporations are still fairly new to Delaware, although there are currently 38 jurisdictions that also have benefit corporations. Delaware was not the first to pick up on the benefit corporation trend. But Senate Bill 47, which went into effect August 1st of 2013, did introduce benefit corporations to Delaware, and we've seen a reasonable amount of them formed over the past few years. Now in Delaware, to have a benefit corporation, you must state a public benefit purpose. And what it does is it changes the fiduciary duties of the directors. It means they must balance the economic interests with the public benefit purpose. And interestingly, what we've seen is a lot of benefit corporations that have been formed in Delaware have been formed both to benefit the public, but also to make it not be all about economics. And what I mean by that is in a traditional corporation, if there is a fantastic offer uh, from someone who wants to acquire you, there may not be a whole lot of options. But in a benefit corporation, there's a lot of flexibility uh, in the sense that their beneficial purpose may not line up exactly along with the uh, purpose of the entity. And therefore, it gives them more flexibility to determine whether they would want to be acquired, whether they would want to you know, be a party to that merger, et cetera. So it, it's quite interesting. These entities can be formed or amended uh, within the state of Delaware. They can also be converted or merged from other jurisdictions. An interesting part about Delaware's law for benefit corporations is that the beneficial purpose will not be policed. In every other jurisdiction, there is a third-party group, whether it's the government or someone outside, uh, who needs to determine whether or not that beneficial purpose is legitimate and sufficient. Delaware's guideline is that it cannot be obscene or hateful, but outside of that, they give you as much flexibility as you'd like. Existing corporations can become benefit corporations with a 66% shareholder vote. Now, originally that was a 90% shareholder vote, but we realized quickly that trying to get 90% of your shareholders to respond, let alone to agree on the same thing, is, is quite a difficult task. So it stopped many mergers from from going through, and therefore it was able to be reduced down to 66%. Another interesting difference between Delaware and the other jurisdictions has to do with the benefit director. Delaware does not require one. In fact, they consider that all directors are equally responsible for everything that takes place. So inherently, everyone in the entity is a benefit director. And finally, in every other jurisdiction with benefit corporations, Delaware require, or they require a public reporting once a year or every other year about how you're doing against your beneficial purpose. 
Delaware does not require this public reporting, stating that it may give away the trade secrets of the entity. So what Delaware requires is that once a year, you report to your shareholders how you are doing against your beneficial purpose. So a lot of differences between the standard laws and the laws of Delaware. Certificates of validation are another very interesting Delaware-only option. And the best way that I try and explain certificates of validation is that it's like a certificate of correction on steroids. Certificates of correction correct an inaccuracy or defect in a previously filed document. The difference is that a certificate of validation corrects an inaccuracy or defect that was made on a corporation's historical record because of a failure to file a document. This type of filing came into being on April 1, 2014. Its official date is the or official name is the Ratification of Defective Corporate Acts and Stock Errors. And what it allows us to do is to go back in time on a corporation's historical record and correct an inaccuracy or defect because of a failure to file a document. It's not the cheapest filing to do. It's a $2,500 base filing fee plus any additional taxes that would have been owed should this filing have been filed properly. So let's just talk through a very basic scenario. I formed a new corporation in 2010. I authorized 10,000 shares of stock. We got really busy doing our business. In 2012, we met, we decided we needed more stock. However, we never filed the document and we ended up issuing 20,000 shares of stock. In 2016, I'm about to do my ITO, and the law firm I'm working with looks at my documents and says, uh-uh, big problem here. You have 20,000 shares of stock outstanding, but you only have 10,000 authorized. The validation allows us to go back to our meeting in 2012 and file a document retroactively authorizing additional shares of stock so that our record is, in fact, correct. Now, there are three dates noted on the document. There's a file date, the effective date, and the corporate act effective date, which is the retroactive date that that document is being inserted. A few things you want to be aware of. Validations do not allow for any type of expedited service in the state because they are also unique and they all require careful review. There is no expedited service offered. You can absolutely pre-clear a validation, though, and quite honestly, I would say that that's generally a very good thing to do so that we don't run into issues when we are about to file it. Now, you may think to yourself, if we can't expedite and we're doing a pre-clearance and we're doing the validation itself, that could take some time. And my response to that is always, it's been inaccurate on the record for at least a certain period of time. We might as well make sure it's 100% correct before trying to rush it through. The other thing that you want to be aware of is any time that you are ordering certified copies of documents, should you see the header say Certificate of Validation of X, whatever the document is, you'll know that that is something that was retroactively put onto the entity's history uh, and that it wasn't necessarily there for all time. Now, the law does allow us to file any type of document using a Certificate of Validation, but the state's policy is that we cannot file a Certificate of Incorporation by virtue of validation simply because the entity needed to exist in order to fail to file the document that we're talking about. Communication context changes. So over the last decade or, or more, there's been a lot of discussion more and more about transparency and making sure that the information on entities is readily available when it is needed. Now, in Delaware, there is not an annual report for the alternative entities like there is for the corporations. So what Delaware requires is that all registered agents hold a communications contact of someone who is affiliated with or knowledgeable about the entity itself. They require the LLC itself to keep a current list of the names and addresses of the members and managers, 
and the LP to keep a current list of the names and addresses of their partners. And then they require us as registered agents to keep a name, an address, and a phone number of the individual who could get us in touch with or who has access to that list of members and managers or partners in the case of an LP. It's very, very important to realize that we are required to have this. The state does frequent audits to make sure that's done. And the reason that I point that out is that when we form an entity for you, we always ask for that communications contact. And should we not get the communications contact from you, we by default list your name. And quite frankly, that's not really a very good idea in the sense that that means that any annual reports, communications, subpoenas, et cetera, come directly to you rather than to where they should end up. So I always encourage you, as soon as you have the communications contact information, get it over to us. And any time that communications contact information changes and needs to be updated, the sooner you have it updated on our record, the better off you'll be. The new Delaware system. It's been just about a year, and one of Delaware's biggest accomplishments recently has been rolling out their new system. We refer to with the old name, or as the same name as the old system, or DCIS, the Delaware Corporation Information System. The really neat thing about the system is that it's much more advanced technologically than the old system. It provides a lot of additional features, such as real-time good standing certificates, uh, short form, available 24 hours a day, seven days a week through select vendors. Uh, it provides us the ability to do same-day invoicing and also to provide more accurate and thorough UCC searches. This system went live just over a year ago. It was September 8, 2015. But the one thing that I've tried to spread the word on is that as with any new system, there are always going to be some bugs and glitches. So any time that you see something that seems just a little bit off or something that you just notice and didn't really love, let us know about it, whether it's incorrect evidence, verbiage issues, question, concerns, anything. The state has been amazingly responsive in working with the agents on getting everything correct. And what I think is most interesting is that we often we'll get feedback from our customers about the way a certificate's worded or, or a page doesn't look correct. We still have a standalone terminal with the old system. So we'll run the exact same transaction through the old system and see what comes out. And in almost every occurrence, we found that the new system and the old system are delivering identical evidence. What we've learned is that people are now more sensitive to what's being printed and they're reading the evidence much more clearly so the issues haven't necessarily been issues in the new system. It's more that the certificate's been wrong for the last 30 years, but it's given us the opportunity to get it corrected so that we'll never see an inaccurate certificate again. So it really is a two-way street. If something looks a little off, let us know, and, and we'll get that fixed with Delaware. Last year in 2015, we saw some changes. Senate Bill 75 went through and made a lot of amendments for corporations the first of which amended Section 102 of the Corporate Code, and we refer to it as substantially similar corporation names. Basically, here's the scoop. A large corporation wants to come into the state, and they want to do business, and they want to utilize a name that's currently being utilized by a smaller non-corporate entity, an LLC, an LP, et cetera. They're not in the same business. There won't be much confusion between the two of them. The corporation reaches out to the smaller entity, and the smaller entity either fails to respond to the corporation's request for consent or asks for a very sizable sum of money, which is pretty excessive. In the past, Delaware did not have any ability to kind of help the larger entity maneuver through this type of uh, situation. But now, with the passing of this amendment, Delaware has the opportunity in their discretion, which doesn't mean that it's always going to happen, but it means that we can certainly ask, to overrule the requirement that uh, requires name consent to be granted. So that means that if a large corporation came in, smaller corporations said, 
we're not going to let you use our name or they wanted you know, $10 million for the use of the name, the larger corporation could petition the state to suspend the requirement for name consent on that one-time basis and allow them to utilize the same name with a different entity type, uh, even without consent. We've seen this go through three times so far since this was enacted. The next two changes really have to do with the entity bylaws. Uh, the first is in regards to forum selection and the discussion of what court systems can be utilized to handle disputes for these entities that are incorporated in the state of Delaware. And Delaware decided that they would allow forum selection with the caveat that the access to the Delaware courts could never be excluded. And really, the sentiment behind it was that many entities incorporate in the state of Delaware for the advantage that they will have access to those Delaware courts. So you can allow or restrict access to any other courts out there across the world, but you cannot restrict the access to the courts in the state of Delaware. The next change came about with fee shifting. And fee shifting really is the discussion of who is paying for the legal fees in the lawsuit. Some states have uh, introduced fee shifting legislation, which has the loser pay all. And Delaware really struggled with this one in the sense that Delaware's law is very, very infrequently restrictive. It's often very permissive. But Delaware felt very strongly that if a minority shareholder had a valid claim but was frightened by the fact that they may lose the case and therefore be saddled with a large legal bill, they might be too fearful to bring it to court where these disputes are fixed in the state of Delaware. So Delaware has opted to prohibit fee shifting for all for-profit stock corporations. We saw some very slight tweaks and amendments to the validation. We saw a few changes in regards to public benefit corporations, specifically that the entity name no longer needed to include the word public benefit corporation or the abbreviation PBC. We also saw the uh, reduction in stock vote uh, from that 90% to the 66% that I mentioned earlier. And the state also provided that the Secretary of State would issue all of the evidence in electronic images and black and white copies. Now this is nothing new in the sense that we've been doing this in Delaware since 2005. However, what is new is it's finally in the law. In many, many, many cases we get asked for the original color certificates or for a hard copy certificate and those simply don't exist in the state of Delaware anymore. If someone's giving you a color certificate, it is a fake because they have not existed for over a decade. And if someone's giving you a hard copy certificate and it's not for an international transaction with that gold apostille seal that's affixed to it, what it means is they received the electronic version from the state, they printed it out, and then sent it to you. So just be aware that all of the documents from Delaware are electronic and they are black and white. 2016, we saw some very new changes. Uh, these went into effect August 1st of this year, so they are pretty recent at this point. We saw the revision of the signatures required on stock certificates. Historically, we needed to have specific officers sign the stock certificates. We're now able to have any two officers who are authorized to sign the stock certificate. The rest of the changes that we saw really have to do with renewals, revivals, uh, restorations, etc. And what we saw was the amendments under sections 311, 312, and 313 for these. Basically, it means that all of the forms to renew, revive, restore a corporation have been altered. For-profit, non-stock, non-profit, etc. What that means is that should you have any forms in-house in your firm or in your corporation, they are no longer valid for these renewals and revivals. So either jump on our site, the state site, or some other trusted site to get a new revised form. For instance, in Section 312, 
the law says that it is now only referred to as a revival. It removed the words renewal, extension, and restoration. Keep in mind that these changes, if not followed, will have your filing rejected. For LLCs and LPs, we saw some changes in regards to series entities. If you're not familiar, a series entity is an overall entity that has individual series that fall underneath of it that are not necessarily affiliated in terms of assets, liabilities, and structure. These series are not currently uh, listed individually in the state's databases. So when they are sued, it's very difficult to tell who it is that you are trying to serve that lawsuit on. So therefore, the law was changed to say that anytime you are serving a series of an LLC or an LP, you must not only list the name of the series you are serving, but you must also list the name of the overall entity that that series belongs to. In regards to UCCs, we haven't seen a tremendous amount of changes. However, keep in mind that Article Number 9 was re-revised in 2013 across the United States. Most states said that they would take the old forms for a certain period of time and then required the new forms. Delaware continues to accept the old forms and the new forms indefinitely. Now, personally, I don't know why you would want to utilize a form that's several years out of date, but the option is there should you really want to. The big change that we saw in regards to UCCs was in regards to the way that they were being filed and processed. In the old days, and by old days I mean before December 1, 2015, you could either log on to a website, type in all of the information yourself, you could send a paper copy of your document to be filed to the registered agent of your choice, and we would do the data entry for you. And your third option was to actually send a paper hard copy document to the state directly. Now, that meant that the state had to do all of the uh, reviewing, all of the data entry, all of the scanning, et cetera. And basically, we had a lot of backlog that was attributed to the fact that there was so much paper moving around. So effective December 1st of 15, Delaware said that it had to be filed electronically. And their definition of electronically is either you going onto a website and doing it through the web or sending that document to us to do the filing. And therefore, that is electronic in the state's mind because they're never seeing that piece of paper. It's already been data entered and uh, imaged prior to them receiving it. The real benefit here is that it's made our search results much more accurate and much more timely. Prior to the change, there were times where we had search results that were up to 12 weeks out of date, and it was really difficult to make a, a reasonable decision upon that. Now, we're seeing uh, that in some cases, the through date or the, the date of the backlog is as little as 72 hours, and it's really allowed us to have much more accurate uh, insight into the UCC liens that do exist out there. So great news. Some pending legislation. Keep in mind that Delaware's legislative season ended June 30th, so there's not a whole lot that's been out there. But there are three items that are being discussed. The first is in regards to corporations. It's under House Bill 216. It talks about the increase of the maximum tax for a corporation by a $15,000 increase. Now what I'll say is that we have seen this uh, take place for the last three years, and we've not seen this actually pass and go through. Uh, so I don't necessarily know that we should expect this to pass anytime soon or ever at all, but it is something that is out there as pending legislation. The second is in regard to series LLCs. There's been a lot of discussion about allowing the series to voluntarily list themselves on the state's database. And so what that means is that in the instance that a specific series wanted to get its own good standing certificate, its own certified copy, open its own bank account, get its own title insurance, they may, if this does pass, be allowed to register themselves as an individual series just for the sake of being 
on the state's records. And finally, there's a lot of talk about amending the foreign corporation annual reports to make them look much more similar to the domestic corporation annual reports, uh, cutting it down to one signature and requiring very uh, standardized information between the two, which would make it a whole lot clearer and a whole lot easier to complete them for both sides. In regards to annual reports, what I want to do is run you through the basics of annual reports and paying taxes, making sure that you're as up-to-date as possible. But first, we have polling question number four for CLE, and this will be like question number three, actually. And uh, the question is, are you responsible for filing annual franchise taxes? A, yes. B, no. C, not sure what an annual franchise tax is. And again, please answer in the poll box, not in the Q&A section. Um, I believe this poll is working correctly this time. And the question is, of course, are you responsible for filing annual franchise taxes? A, yes, you are responsible. B, no, you don't do that. It's not your job. Or C, not sure what an annual franchise tax is. Just a couple more seconds here. And I think we have finished here. And we're going to be sending you the results, Alan. And as you can probably see, actually, we have a large percentage here of almost 70% are yes for filing the ta franchise taxes. Okay, back to you. Fantastic. Well, that's great. So with Delaware Domestic Corporations, they have a March 1st franchise tax deadline by which they must complete their annual report in its entirety and pay their annual franchise tax. March the 1st is celebrated on March 1st every single year in Delaware without exception. So they do not, for instance, give you a pass until the, the Monday afterwards if it falls on a weekend. Uh, last year, March 1st fell on a Sunday, and Delaware stayed open until midnight Eastern time on Sunday night. Anyone who paid before then was current, and anyone who paid after that was delinquent. Keep in mind that if they do not pay and file for two consecutive years, they will lose their good standing status and go void, which means that we'll have to do additional filings to get them back into good standing status. There are two methods provided for calculating our franchise tax. There's what we call the authorized shares method, which is the default. It's based upon the number of shares of stock that you have authorized for your entity. Your minimum tax is $175 per year, and your maximum tax is $180,000 per year. We also have what we call the assumed par value method, which is the recalculated method. The minimum is $350 per year. The maximum is $180,000 per year. About 40% of the taxpayers in Delaware opt to use this recalculated method. My theory is that anyone who owes $350 or more should try both methods and see which one works out better in their favor because the lesser of the two taxes is what you should be paying. In your handouts, we will make sure that we get to, um, that you have all of the details on each of these. So what that means is that you'll have a list of you know, if you have between one share of stock and 5,000 shares of stock, this is your tax rate, as well as the calculation page that you can use for the assume par value method. However, I will say that there are really, really fantastic online, computer, online uh, calculators, as well as great knowledge resources, so that you can avoid trying to do those by hand, because they're pretty sticky to deal with. Some issues to keep in mind, if you don't pay on time, you'll be assessed a penalty. Interest then accrues at a rate of 18% per year, so it gets pretty expensive. Quarterly companies are those entities that owe more than $5,000 a year in tax. And what it means is that instead of having one annual deadline, they have four quarterly deadlines. So they'll owe tax on March 1st, June 1st, September 1st, and December 1st. That also gives them four opportunities to be hit with interest should they miss those deadlines. And then we get a lot of questions about no par stock. Uh, no par stock is absolutely allowed in Delaware. 
However, the theory is that no par stock in Delaware is worth significantly more than par value stock. What that means is that Delaware charges more money to authorize that no par stock up front. But what it also means that if people aren't super familiar with this is that because there is no par value listed, they cannot use that assumed par value method in the tax calculation. So it does mean that you are locking yourself into the authorized shares method for eternity. So in the chance that your company is merging, dissolving, converting away from being a corporation, you must file your annual report for what we'd call the current year, the year that we're in that's not quite due yet. And it also means that you will pay taxes for the portion of that year that you were in existence. What we do is we prorate it to the end of the month in which you are going to be dissolving, merging, or converting. So right now, if we did it, let's say, today, uh, we would be paying tax through the end of September. Uh, and it would require that we complete that final annual report. And until that final annual report was completed, we would not be able to complete that dissolution, merger, or conversion. On our other entities, we have are LLCs, LPs, and GPs, and they pay a flat annual tax. It's due on or before June the 1st, and it is a flat $300 fee. You'll notice that there is not a physical report that's being filed. It is just a tax payment at this point. Keep in mind that if they do not pay on or before June the 1st, they are assessed a penalty and interest just like the other entities, which means that our $300 instantly becomes $507.50. It gets fairly expensive pretty fast. Our double LPs and our triple LPs pay an annual tax and file an annual report, also due on or before June the 1st. They pay $200 per general partner per year. What many people forget, though, is that double and triple LPs are dual existence entities. And so what that means is that a double LP has an underlying GP, a triple LP has an underlying LP. In order to truly be in good standing, we must have both the upper level and the lower level set of compliance requirements taken care of. So in the case of a triple LP, we need to make sure that we pay and file for the triple LP, but we also need to make sure that we pay for that LP that sits underneath of it. Because these entities typically pay a lot less tax and also certainly file a lot less in regards to the report, they instantly lose their good standing status and go into what we call X status or ceased good standing if they miss their deadline. What that means is obviously we cannot get good standings for the entity. It also means that the state would not be able to file documents for the entity until they're back in good standing. And most importantly, it means the entity may not be able to maintain lawsuits in state courts. Therefore, things like filing a counterclaim or defending certain cases in court could be quite hampered by the fact that the entity has not paid their taxes. The good news is that there is no filing necessary to return the entity back to good standing. What that means is we just need to pay our past due taxes penalties and interest, and we're back in good standing like nothing ever happened. Uh, one of the questions we received was in regards to the quarterly companies. Are they required to pay on or by the dates regardless of whether the date falls on a weekend? Yes, absolutely. So if September the 1st is, let's say, a Saturday, you would want to pay it by August 31st that, that Friday, or if you could pay it on the weekend, that's, that's fine. But realize the quarterly companies tend to be the larger dollar amounts, which means that it tends to be a whole lot easier to do those transactions on the date when the banks are open and we can actually do transfers and uh, do some of those items uh, within normal uh, banking uh, days. 
Uh, we have a question in regards to the stock certificates. Um, stock certificates, what specifically was amended, and this is clearly documented in the handouts for you, uh, Section 158 was amended, was amended to provide that any two officers of the corporation who are authorized to do so may execute stock certificates on behalf of the corporation. This is effective as of August 1, 2016. Previously, the signature of the chairperson or vice chairperson of the board of directors or the president or vice president and treasurer or assistant treasurer or secretary or assistant secretary was required. And now it basically says that any two officers who are authorized to do so can opt to do so. You don't uh, need to have specific individuals. I have a few minutes for questions, so I'm going to try and get through as many as I can at this point. Um, so substantially similar corporation name section 102, what if the name of the large corporation or a portion of the name is federally registered? Would Delaware take that into consideration and deny the corporation the use of the name or would the smaller entity then have to take action to preclude the corporation from infringing on its right uh, to the registered name? Keep in mind that nothing Delaware does impacts the federal trademarks or any uh, federal level law. What would probably take place is a conversation between the Secretary of State's office and the two entities, and many of these issues would be uh, fleshed out. Um, Simply put, there's not going to be a real cut and dry answer, and that's the reason why it gives the state the authority to overrule if they deem it appropriate. So really what's taking place is the opportunity to have that conversation, and that conversation, there are really no, um, no guarantees in either direction. Uh, what, what will take place will really be specific to that transaction itself. Uh, another question, how would you go about updating and changing the number of authorized shares of a corporation? Uh, we would file an amendment. So an, a stock amendment would be filed to a corporation to either increase or reduce uh, and decrease the number of shares that an entity has. Keep in mind that in Delaware you're paying tax based upon the number of shares that you have. So it's always a little bit of a delicate balancing act in the sense you, you want to have enough to meet all of your needs, but you also want to make sure that you don't have too many that you're paying a lot of taxes uh, for no good reason. Where can I update the list of the names and addresses of our members and managers? That's something that's held in-house. Uh, Delaware does not file or record that whatsoever. So internally, you would either have a hard copy or an electronic document. It could be an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you could have a fancy software for entity management uh, from your registered agent. But either way, whatever you opt to do, you want to have that recorded in some way, shape, or form. Which is the service that allows you to make corrections as many times as possible, and are you eligible for a refund? Uh, so you can file a certificate of correction for any inaccuracy or defect in a previously filed document. Uh, you can do that at any point. There's no statute of limitations on it, so there's no issues there. Uh, but you would never get a refund on your previously filed document fees. Whatever you paid to do it incorrectly, the state would, in fact, keep that document. I have a question that says, what is the benefit of this type of entity, but I'm not sure what type of entity it is. I'm thinking maybe the benefit corporation. And if that's the case, the real benefit is it allows you to have uh, an entity that has a socially responsible beneficial purpose. In many ways, it allows you to attract investors that are more concerned with social responsibility than um, simply just making profits. I am at the 2 o'clock time period for the East Coast, and so I want to be very cognizant of everyone's time. We have used our entire hour, so I will uh, work on answering the rest of the questions and get those answers back to you. But I will invite Amanda back on, and I will thank you all in advance for attending. Okay, thank